The largest religious commemoration, with some are saying over 20 million, I don't know. A ritual journey that typically takes five days to complete upon arrival in Iraq's holy city of Karbala. Arbaeen commemorates the end of the 40-day mourning period for the Prophet Muhammad's grandson, Imam Hussein. One analyst says its popularity is the result of its message. Stand in against tyranny and oppression, and that's a message that uh, you know all human beings adhere to. While it is a Shia spiritual exercise, not unusual to see Sunnis, Christian, Yazidis, and Zoroastrians also partake in this pilgrimage. What was your advice, or what would you tell them that you know about the what would you would you encourage them to go? Well, I would or? just quite simply a two-letter word: go. Yeah. That's all. I mean, obviously they might find it difficult with a visa for Iraq, you know. Um, if they really did want to go, then if they're determined, just like I was, I found a way. It's how I found you people, or even vice versa, it's irrelevant. But uh, if you want to go, you'll find a way of getting your visa, you know. You'll make friends or you'll go to an Islamic centre or whatever and uh, you'll find a way of getting a visa. So you'll go, yeah, I'd recommend it. You wouldn't even need any money in your pocket except to give to charity, you know. You, you will be fed, clothed, bedded. You have nothing to worry about. Martin Mudlin. Um, I live in Bromley in Kent now. Um, I'm known as Martin the Veg from the days when I had an allotment and uh, used to go into the pub with a veg on the way back. So the, that name stuck. Um, I'm now just coming up to 67, obviously retired, disabled now. Um, and I've been coming here now for something like 51, 52 years. We do originally come from West London. My grandparents actually got married in Fulham Palace Road there. And there's a youngster I lived in Fulham. I uh, can't remember the names of the roads now. But uh, all my uncles and aunties either lived in Hammersmith or Chiswick. I didn't have a very happy childhood and as much as my dad used to beat us quite a bit um, you know in temper I'm not saying we didn't deserve it of course me and my twin brother because we were naughty and uh, I used to climb out the bedroom window when I was quite young and go off traveling you're hiking up up the country and my dad would get a phone call from a police station you know come and pick me up somewhere like maybe Nottingham or somewhere uh, by the time I got to 15, I, I, you could buy a day ticket then to go over the channel. You'd take your photos in a booth and you could go over for the day. And I hitchhiked all around Europe and that, on that day thing, I was about 15. And I used to play the mouth organ under the Eiffel Tower for a few shillings. Or francs then, of course. Um, so I've always had it in my blood. I don't know where it came from because none of my family were that way inclined, but that's the way it's been. And it's been easier to do travelling, really, especially with the two marriages, uh, as I've got older. You know, I've been able to, I retired early through uh, illness, so I was able to save and squint about and go on quite a few trips, you know. I've enjoyed everywhere really. I loved Kashmir. It was a nice place. You know, I was right up near the Chinese border there and more or less like a sort of a lake district, foot of the Himalayas. I enjoyed that. Iran I enjoyed a few years back. Very enjoyable. History, you know. Um, I travelled in Palestine, which was, well, I wouldn't say it was one of the nicest places, but interesting, of course. Well, Iran was basically, um, I went on my 60th birthday, or, or that was the trip for my 60th. Um, it was basically because I'd been reading Middle East politics for about 30 years, Iran always comes into that. So I thought, well, it's about time I went there. That was it, really. I knew Persia was obviously uh, plenty of history. Um, I hadn't got it, changed my reading by then. 
But that was the reason, was mainly because it comes up in the political things, but like, you know, like it does today. Well, I'm interested in the, um, the Arbeen, you know, the, uh, the walk for um, Imam Hussein. I'm very interested in that, so I think it would be a good experience, like, you know. It's, it's a big thing in the, in, the, in the Shia world, you know, um, part of their makeup. And it'd be good to be part of that, you know, I will find it very interesting. Well, my two years since uh, we found out I had cancer was actually only last week. What happened was I had had a mild headache at the front of my head here for probably about three weeks, which is the time they tell you to give it before you go to a doctor. Um, I'll put it down to the central eating, like, you know, but um, as luck had it, one particular morning, I, I went to get out of bed and I, I, sort of, I was weak and I, I fell and I, I knocked my right ear against the um, cupboard, you know, like the small cabinet, bedside cabinet, and it cut my ear. And although it was only a nick, because obviously I've been taking aspirin for years because I had a mini stroke some years back and had the uh, stent put in my neck. Um, so obviously I bleed quite profusely like with even a nick with shaving. So I uh, decided to go to the hospital. Um, my daughter came with us as well, my wife went and we got there at lunchtime, early lunchtime. They couldn't find anything wrong with me until the doctor came in, a young fella, Dale, lovely man, um, came in, told us they'd found something. And my daughter sort of said, like, it's not, is it cancer? And he sort of nodded. So they sort of broke down in tears, like, uh, I suppose I was, just took it in my stride, really. Maybe it didn't sink in. That was about half past eight, as I say. Um, turned out I had a, um, what do you call it in the head? Uh, tumour. Just down there, it was on my cerebellum, which is your balance, part of your brain that affects your balance. So anyway, I had my first um, meetings at Guy's Cancer Centre, and it turned out that I was right, it was a guinea pig treatment. You know, and obviously when you're told you've got cancer, you'll take anything really, as far as I, I was concerned. So I said, yeah, I'll do it. Um, and anyway, as luck had it, I, they took the lump out in Lewisham, Lewisham Hospital, it all went well. In fact, I was home the next day, albeit wobbly. Um, got myself a mobile scooter, you know, so I could still take the dog out every morning. That, that was Andy. Um, and after that, some months later, the cancer centre applied to the government to put me on this special machine and I went to the private hospital, the um, Booper Hospital, to have a special, uh, like a helmet screwed onto my skull and it zapped all the rest of the cancer away but left the rest of the head alone which is what most national health people have and uh, you know it's pretty painful and this that and the other so I was very lucky that I, I was given that because it was part of the guinea pig stuff and they said yes you know and of course that was like a hotel five star hotel being in there and that more or less hoovers up the stuff on your brain that's left the cancer that's left because obviously you can't touch it so that was a result um, and every three weeks I go into guys. So I'm going in this afternoon to have my treatment. Um, I have a cannula put in. We put the juice through, and they're, what they're doing is they're playing with my immune system and trying to trick the cancer. So I have quite a hard time. Not the same as people that have chemo and all that, but I still have difficulties. Uh, my legs are weak, you know. Uh, I won't go too much into the details and that, you know. So I've made it here today. I make it to the ground for most games. I'm actually knackered when I do get here, but anyway, cut a long story short, my cancers uh, I've got lung cancer, uh, liver cancer, 
uh, I got cancer in my pancreas and in my spine and all four cancers have been arrested so I am a success case you know. but it has its price of course but I'm not complaining of course and the other question you asked me is how that affects my travelling it obviously makes it very difficult I move very slowly I don't get my money's worth when I go unfortunately but it doesn't stop me going because it's what I want to do so it does seem a shame that I spend money doing these things but I have to do them and I do them and I'll do as much as I can if it means one day I can't do much then so be it it's the way it's wheeled Last question. What are you most looking forward to being to Iraq? Being on the walk, seeing uh, the shrines, which look absolutely fabulous. The shrine, obviously, of Imam Ali, as well as Imam Hussein, his son, um, Imam Abbas. Meeting the people on the walk. Sunshine. <laughs> and just generally being part of it. Trip. Bit of a drag, that's pretty normal. Air travel. You tired? I've had worse. I've had worse. Alright, what are you looking forward to? First uh, night. Apart from three points Saturday, I would have to say the MMN Shrine. The two shrines are the MMN Hussein Shrine and the, and the walk, but not for the walking. More to see the people. Look at their emotions and faces, etc. Um, yeah. How does it feel to be in the city, which used to be the capital, yeah, where Imam Ali and Islam was in power? And, uh, yeah. A bit different now, of course. We must have seen it how it was, but yeah, I'm sure it'd be better when I'm on the road, you know, on the way from the airport. But yeah, it feels good to be here. It's a destination, and I'm here. Uh, so yeah. Ali Shrine. Uh, you can see it in front of me in the Golden Dome. It's very, very busy. It's not even 8 o'clock in the morning yet. Um, a bit dusty, getting very warm, and looking forward to going inside. I did sort of expect a lot of crowds, you know, it's just going to get busier and busier. I did like it last night, seeing it all lit up, it was a bit special. Um, the camera obviously, and the uh, security spoils it a bit, so we'll probably get a better look inside. Personally, I will feel quite a bit of a connection with all the reading that I've done and how I've gone on to uh, Islam and the Caliphates, etc. So I will feel a connection with, with knowing the life story of this man. We'll put lots of mental pictures inside my head. So it'd be like watching a film and it'll come together. So that's another connection that I personally think will make. It'll, it'll sort of be like a jigsaw and the bits and pieces coming together. Knowing how he met his death and how he lived his life. Um, this is sort of like the finish of it, I guess. Yeah. Has your relationship with him, Armani, has that improved, strengthened? Do you, do you kind of feel that you're closer to this character? Yes, I feel like I know him now. I mean, especially reading his uh, Peak of Elegance is a fantastic book for anybody, any religion, any person, any right-minded, decent person would enjoy it. And it can uh, put you in good stead for being a decent person. And uh, by reading that and having visited the shrine, I do feel I know him a lot better, you know, um, fantastic character and I feel makes me feel very strongly that um, he really should have been the first caliph as well you know 
Well, I'm still not sure why he wasn't. And obviously, I know about the, you know, what happened. But it shouldn't have been allowed to happen. But unfortunately, what I've read and what I conclude is he was very unlucky that everything went against him. So many different circumstances, you know, even if you look at like the Karajites, you know, how he had to go and that caused problems, you know, which eventually led to his death. Um, I just think he was very unlucky. Everything conspired against him. So, in terms of Imam Ali what parts of his character and his personality really like, stood out for you? Oh, well, without a doubt, you know, you can compare um, Imam Ali with Jesus, really. You know, they were both perfect men. Um, he was obviously sent from above uh, for a reason, you know, to get religion started and to get people to be decent people and to live properly. Uh, and uh, this man buried here is in the same mould. You know, they're like two peas in a pod and uh, he's a special man. Otherwise, you know, why would you have all these people here like today? So I'm excited to go inside the shrine. Um, obviously, it's a sad time for these people. So, you know, there's not a great deal of joy here because of the sadness involved. So until maybe we get inside and feel uh, some spirituality, maybe you know when I'm inside the shrine, um, the question will probably be answered more inside rather than outside. Last thing, what are you looking for from this experience? From here in Najaf with Imam Ali, what your quest? What are you looking for? I'm just hoping more than anything to connect all the pieces in all the books that I've been reading these last, uh, say, two years, which has led me through the early days of the Caliphate, the star, uh, death of Muhammad and uh, the Ali and uh, the situation at that time, um, and also the, the beginnings of the religion, etc. It's uh, like a jigsaw, it will put all the pieces together, I think, and I, I think that would be the main thing, the complete picture. Yeah, I found that fantastic, the um, shrine, inside the shrine itself. Um, I felt honoured to be able to touch his, uh, the tomb. It was uh, quite an experience, you know, that I think show my respects by touching it um, to see how much it meant to the uh, local people but, you know the Iraqis you could tell how much it meant to them to just touch it and say that say a prayer the, the the lady who was sobbing uh, you know audibly at the entrance there was very moving showed you how much uh, love for the man who was there you know and the sadness for how he met his end so, yeah, that, I don't think I'll ever forget that, seeing that lady like that. Yeah, so a lot of people go to see Imam Ali with uh, wishes and prayers. Did you say a little prayer for yourself? I took a uh, small one, like, really, yeah, just, just that I can just carry on living, right, with my cancer. That's it? Yeah, I uh, asked for more, as much time as I've been given. I've had been lucky, I've been given two, two years now. Um, I just hope that I can keep going, you know, this has helped me to to reach that goal, to keep going. And uh, if Imam Ali was alive today, what would you say to him, what would you ask him? Oh, that's a difficult question, really. Um, I think I would just have to have a nice long conversation with him, really. It would probably be about the political situation at the time. <laughs> You know, which was obviously why I read it, a very fascinating subject, so um, I might even be able to advise him, you know. Um, so perhaps you should do certain things a different way, or maybe, you know, and uh, I'm sure we could sit down and have a good chat. Touching the shrines was important to me, and that was hard work. You know, I'll never forget that one fella there, he was quite, a, you know, stocky. stocky quite a tall bloke and he spent a lot of time there. No one could get near the shrine, you know. Um, I didn't like the idea of everyone shoving and pushing and elbowing. I didn't think that was right, you know. Um, 
There should be some kind of a system, you know, where people can do their touching and rub their silk scarves or whatever, you know, for a souvenir. You know, because I just managed to touch it with my fingers and that was my, it was important for me out of respect. You know, and I did manage it, so I was pleased about that. That's a, a big memory of mine. Um, I'm disappointed that I couldn't take any pictures inside the shrine, but I can understand obviously why not. You know, I took pictures inside the shrine of in, in Iran, but my God, I was careful, no one saw me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so once we came away from there, I could enjoy the um, surroundings and the glass. It was phenomenal, you know. Better than anything I saw in Persia or Iran, I must say, it's one of the nicest shrines I've ever been to. And very fitting for the man who's uh, buried there. Very fitting indeed. Oh yes, the, w the walk itself was very vivid. You have to remember, I didn't walk very much, did I, because of my legs. Uh, I did what I could, and I was lucky that I was in the position that you people, you know, had me a car to move further up the, the, the walk. But, uh, yeah, the walk was fantastic. Um, there's lots of people did come up to me to uh, talk. Lots didn't, obviously, but a lot did. Um, Lots of them wanted to have pictures taken of me. I particularly enjoyed the, when the Iranian TV turned up and were desperate to interview me. That was interesting, especially as I'd been to Iran, you know, recently. I found that interesting. Uh, and I, liked, I enjoyed watching the people with their flags and the kids, you know. And they were all walking 80 kilometres, 50 miles, you know. And fair play to them, like, you know. Um, I was very uh, respectful of what they were doing, you know. How, how are you feeling physically wise? I mean, it's really hot. We're walking for 700 metres now. Yeah. Well, I'm glad the sun's not out and such, but it's going to be out soon. It's, um, it's not too bad for walking in, really, you know. I've been in proper heat and it's, it's quite tolerable for me. And, um, my thighs are starting to play up really, unfortunately. Legs are doing okay because of the painkillers. Um, so yeah, I just need to keep going. I've right, got right, a little ribbon there. Everything's good so far. So one, one question I think is on everyone's mind is, why are you doing this walk? Why have you decided to take this quest oh, well, to walk from Najib to Karbala? Yeah, I think uh, it's to show my respect for the uh, Shia religion, for the uh, Imam Hussain, you know, what he went through, just the humanity, really. Uh, so, you know, I'm doing it for him, the same as what lots of other people are, um, as well as, of course, experiencing it for myself, and not just looking at the TV screen. Or here. Is it as you expected it to be? I think so, yes, I think so. Yeah, you know, to be fair, you know, it's uh, the world's shrunk now. You can go on the uh, see videos, and although I've only had a quick glance, I didn't want to spoil it for myself by watching loads of videos. I just glanced at one or two, so yeah, it's exactly how I well, it's not the same as being here. I'm here, you know. I came to live football matches, as I said before, you know. It's, you're there, it's live. And you're watching it on the street. So you actually be in prison, taking the you know, feeling experience? Yes, yeah, so I want to do as much as I can for myself, for my religion, you know, my God's the same as your God. So I'm showing my faith in what I believe in by doing this as well. No, it's, I'm not in a race. I feel I'm part, just by being here, I'm part of the walk and I'm showing my respect for the uh, Shia and for the for the Imam. I'm showing my respects for that. I believe by being here, you know, and it's, uh, and it's shown me what I read about, you know, back in the day, in the early days. People used to come here and that's what they're doing now. It's just that it's got bigger and uh, I'm there doing it. Something that happened thousands of years ago. It's history. It's great. It's been 
spent the last 40 years travelling the Middle East, so yeah. it's nothing new to me. Uh, the only thing that's new to me is uh, the Iraqi people, and obviously this this Arbeen walk uh, is showing me the Iraqi people. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I know about Arab culture and I've been to many Arab countries and spent many times in different places. So the culture's not a shock or anything. It's mainly just the, the hospitality is uh, top of the tree, like, you know, for Iraqis. What kind of things have you received already from people? Oh, we've been offered sweets, obviously plenty of water. Uh, Lunch, chicken and rice. Um, I mean, if you were to go into every place that they asked you to go into eat, um, you wouldn't be able to move, would you? Your stomach would be bulging and you'd be carrying it in front of you with a willpower. It's phenomenal, uh, like, you know, the hospitality with all the armchairs, you know, places to rest, to go to sleep. Fantastic, yeah, fantastic. Okay, so we've just had two hours of very slow walking because it's been very difficult for me. Uh, my thighs are starting to play up now. I'm getting spasms in there and legs ache, even though I'm full of tramadol. Um, so it's time to stop now and have a rest, uh, stretch my legs out and just chill, you know. Um, drink another cup of lovely shade. Yeah, and how have you found it up to now? Okay, good. Yeah, it's been good. How much do you reckon yeah. you'll be able to do? I think with another rest, probably about the same again, probably. It's hard to say, really. I, you know, I just haven't got that routine. I'm going to do as much as I can, obviously. That's the idea for me. Uh, we just have to get off the cuff, I'm afraid, to see how we get on. Well, I think the multi have been fantastic, you know. Uh, I've managed to lay down to stretch my legs, which has obviously been playing up. Um, I sat down and some bread and some meat was given to me. Um, and then some more meat came out and was given to me. Uh, I've had young boys who obviously are interested, and not in myself, one to get me, uh, you know, cups of tea or chai, um, which has been nice because I love the stuff. Um, and I've been able to lay down and relax. Can't sleep because of the flies, unfortunately. You know, uh, it's part of the course. Um, they stop you sleeping. But the uh, hospitality uh, is fantastic. I'm looking at the queue now because there's food come out and there's been a massive queue for the last 10 minutes and, it's, and the queue's been moving. So, you know, that is, for the people, is fantastic. You know, I've seen people with bread, you know, you could fill a 50 ton lorry like with bread, the amount of bread I've seen people have, it's been freshly baked for the people, never eaten tea, you know, I just went to the toilet earlier, and the toilets are clean really, you know, I mean obviously not spotless, but they haven't been left in a mess, so, uh, you know, if, if one's been blocked up, it looks like someone's quickly cleaned it, you know, it was very quick clean, it surprised me, I thought it might be like the last place we went to at the airport, it wasn't too clever. Um, so yeah, you know, it's a, it's a great place to relax. I'm sure there's people in this country who earn a lot of money and I'm sure a lot of these people don't, you know, and I think that they've probably, you know, spent their own money or maybe you know, their own property, maybe their own, one of their own sheep has been, you know, slaughtered for the food. Um, they've given up their time to make sure that everybody is fed and watered and, uh, and, and can go to the toilet and cleanliness. It's a fantastic thing to see, you know. Providing you don't mind roughing it a bit, I'd recommend it to anybody, you know. Obviously, if you're looking for five-star hotel comforts, you're not going to get it. But, uh, you know, if you're a travelling person and uh, you're interested in religions and uh, the Shia in particular, then, yeah, you should come. You would be looked after. Yeah, to be among it and see exactly how strong that is. I mean, obviously, I learned many years ago about Arab hospitality, especially the Bedouin having been among them. Um, 
But yeah, it's outstanding. You know, the, I mean, the one, I can remember it all more or less, but the one that sticks out for me was uh, not long after we'd started out from the Jaff and we'd stopped, it might have been our first stop, to rest, have something to eat, drink, go to the toilet, etc. And we hadn't walked maybe another 10, 15 yards when we met that character fella who tried to get us into his wall cube. And he wouldn't take no for an answer. You know, we just eaten, we were full up, we had to get going in it again. But that fella was a character. I, 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 can, I can just picture him being here now, you know, trying to f almost force us into his, you know, to eat and drink and rest when we, unfortunately, we just finished. So that really sums it up, really. That's like that all the way, isn't it? And how, how, uh, how is it, how do you feel now that you've taken a bit of a nap? You said that you were quite tired you came oh, in. I am very tired, you know. Uh, but that's not because of the weather or the walk, that is because of my situation. Unfortunately, I've got a bag that I could have done without the weight that's in there. You know, uh, that has helped the situation on my shoulders. Um, Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to walk anywhere near as much as I'd, I'd love to. Well, I mean, I'd love to, as I said previously, do the whole thing, but that's impossible. Um, it's just a case of seeing what I'm like tomorrow now. Um, you know, you have to remember that my, my oncologist told me that I shouldn't walk really at all, so any walking I do is probably a bonus. Um, which I'm sorry about, but it's the way it is. Oh, I just felt 40 years younger in a mad taxi ride with about 200 other people. Uh, that was enjoyable, I must admit. My mind started wandering back to as many years ago. Uh, so yeah, we've got a taxi a short way to help me along. We were, we were uh, about halfway now to the holy city of Kabala. Uh, looking for somewhere to spend the night now so I can rest up, we can eat, relax, see how my legs are tomorrow. Uh, it's just starting to get dark now so the camera can probably just pick it up on. Um, so the journey continues. I think as we get closer, it'll probably be a lot tougher with the crowds. Yeah, it uh, it's, gets more exciting the more you sort of get closer, I guess. Do you reckon, how, how do you reckon you'll be tomorrow morning if you, if you get a good night's sleep? What are you hoping for? I think it's all down to the big fella upstairs. You get a good rest, you know. I don't need a lot of sleep, luckily for me. It's all about the... Very top and tight on the three sides now. Sort that out when I get back home. Um, legs feel a bit better now that I've rested. So I'll definitely be able to do a bit more walking, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Martin, um, one of our members of the community, he's got a mocap of himself, of himself, well, he's got a mocap of his own, and uh, he's invited us to stay there tonight. So I want to go, and I'm going to invite, I'm going to introduce you to Abu Rasul. What's his name? His name is Abu Rasul. Uh, what's that in show? The father of Rasul. The father of the messenger. No, I don't know why I call him. It's not in You can call him. Call him Rasul. Yeah, Rasul. Yeah, it's Rasul. 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 Oh, yeah, I know yeah. that name. Rasul. Yeah. yeah, okay. Rasul. And this is... So last night we met up with Abdul Rasul um, and what he did was because his mocap was still in preparation he managed to you know introduce us to someone who was willing to take uh, take um, us into his house I mean I mean the uh, question I want to ask you is that how um, do you think difficult how easy is it to take care and to, to host people especially on a walk like this 
it was a great effort from the uh, Rasu. If you look around at the room, obviously we had some one or two other men and some interesting conversations last night. Um, I believe there's another big room somewhere full of people as well. So, what a great effort. Can you say it's um, everything that the walk represents, really, isn't it? And how was your experience this uh, last night? As in, were you taken care of? Did they provide the best service they could? Were they very, very eager to keep you happy? Well, it was no different to staying in a hotel, if you really. Probably, well, it's better than staying in a hotel. We had the um, typical um, Arab big silver platter came out with some food, lovely food. Uh, we sat down to eat. Um, lovely food. These magnificent blankets came out and some mattresses. And um, yeah, we was all able to go to sleep and uh, have some rest. Uh, um, we were at Abu Sul's Mokib uh, right now, which is poll number 564. Uh, Mokib's not prepared properly, and they're still like, getting everything ready. Uh, Abu Sen was nice enough to invite us to his home, and then we stayed at his house, and it was very, very hospitable. He's brought us in because he's part of the Mokib as well, showing the preparations uh, that they're going through. There's uh, the Zawar that are coming to visit. The uh, we've got chickens over there, they're going to prepare tomorrow. We've got chickpeas over there, loads of pots and pans and plates, plastic plates, disposable plates. We see over there, there's loads of gas canisters for the cooking. Um, and inshallah, they'll be ready tomorrow to start serving. Uh, what do you think of the set of mine? Well, oh, you know, they're putting their own time and money into it. It's a fantastic effort, unbelievable, really. You know, these people are working in the heat all to serve the people. Fantastic. <laughs> He's saying every year, every year, come, come for it. Ask him one question. أبو حسين شايك بأنه هو الضيف الجم من لندن. أهلاً وسهلاً بي. بده يمشي. أهلاً نشرب بي إن شاء الله. وبركة يحصلنا بعد خمسة ستة عشرة من ربع يجون يستسلمون إن شاء الله يمر الإمام الحسين وهو جاي مشي من الإمام علي اللي هنا أنا وباي تمنا ضيف عزيز علينا وإن شاء الله باشر بالإمام الحسين يستسلم وإن شاء الله يصلي يمر الإمام الحسين وهاي من بركات الإمام الحسين. إن شاء الله. وأهلاً وسهلاً بكم كل وقت تجون. إن شاء الله. My thighs are starting to lie up now, it's a new thing for me, I only started a couple of weeks back. I haven't had a chance to speak to anybody about it yet. Uh, yeah, I want to keep going, obviously. Uh, I'm getting weaker, as you can see, it's slowing down a bit. Not that I was going much faster in the first place. You're getting more optimistic now that you're officially in the city of Kobala? Uh, well, boundaries can be such a long way away. It doesn't really mean a lot. It often means that you've got a long way to go. How, how, how do you empathise with maybe the uh, the women of the the camp of Imam Hussein who had well, to walk this this exact walk that you're walking now? I'm sure they probably felt a lot like I do now, but mentally they'd have had even more things to deal with, wouldn't they? Emotionally and mentally, probably seeing all their loved ones massacred. So I just don't know how they've done it. To be honest with you, I know. Generations before are usually a lot tougher than the ones that come after. But uh, I don't know how they got through that, I really don't. So, I mean, we're walking on tarmac, it's going to be a lot easier as well. I'm sure they were walking on all sorts of sand and scrub and stuff. So, yeah, you can only admire it, can't you? You can understand, the, understand why the people are walking. Are you uh, surprised by the sheer number of people considering it's still early days? Well, I was never going to be surprised by the number, but the numbers that I'm seeing now, considering it's about 10 days to go till the actual, the actual day, uh, I'll be in the 40th, uh, the 40th day, which is the end of October, the last day, it's, it's phenomenal, you know, it's like this for miles and miles and miles, you know, well, from the beginning, you know, if not before. We've got people from here, there and everywhere, we've just spoken to a, Iranian fellows come from Iran. Um, yeah, it's, 
It's quite a sight. How are you feeling? Knackered. Yeah, how's it been the last few hundred poles? Tough. Yeah. I've been on autopilot, <laughs> basically. I'm knackered. Yeah, mine's been, he's done really well. He's done about 150 poles. He's been walking now. He's not well. He's elderly and you can't really see but he's really really fragile, his, his legs are really really slim, um, it's very difficult for him to walk. Uh, even before he left London, his doctors advised him to walk a certain amount of distances a day, so he's got like a daily rate. Um, he's well exceeded that um, and he's really really pushed himself, alhamdulillah. I hope, I hope, <laughs> Allah and I hope the Hell of Bait accept his, his efforts and I acknowledge his, his hard work and in this uh, journey of his towards Karbala. But, um, I just, I just hope tomorrow that you know he can he can tonight he can um, rest well, uh, you know rejuvenate, and tomorrow's another day and hopefully we can you know tackle some more poles and shot. What poles he at now? We're at 10:50 at the moment. 10:50. We're hoping to get to somewhere more like over 1100, 11:50 around that mark. But, yeah, 10.50 is tapping out, so hopefully we'll call it a day to today and tomorrow, inshallah, we'll continue our way towards Kadwala, inshallah. The tiredness and the fatigue in my legs, which is what still affects me now, this is the one thing I've got. And although that could be down to my treatment, uh, it could also be, I did a lot of heavy work over the years and my legs were aching before I was even told that I had cancer, you know, so... You know, maybe the cancer had been growing slowly and sapping and taking energy from the legs, but my legs can be really bad now. And, you know, sometimes I can hardly walk. I have a walking stick now. And, uh, sometimes I need it and sometimes I don't. But even when I don't, I walk very slowly. I have to stop, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd love to have done the whole walk. You know, I did a 50-mile walk when I was 14, the old Kent Messenger walk, you know. Um, Margate to, to Maidstone, to, to the barracks, um, and I won prizes for that, you know, because I was going to give up at Canterbury, and then I was going to give up at Ashford, and I was just kept going and kept going, and fell asleep for about five hours just outside Maidstone, and I got woken up by my dad and my twin brother, uh, and I finished the course, you know, so yeah, I've always been a walker, but so I can't even walk all the fields and that around here and that anymore, you know, it's, I just can't do it. So yeah, I had that to deal with. That's, that was probably the only two things, really. We'll probably rest up for the rest of the day. Um, do you reckon you got much in you for the re for tomorrow? I've got more for tomorrow? Have you got any strength in, in you for tomorrow, you reckon? Oh, I'll find it. I'll find it. I might better find it later tonight. Never say never. Do you know how many poles you've done? No. I can't count them. It's been a good effort there. Good. That's what it's all about. I wish I could do more. I really do. How are you feeling with, in, in terms of your health? In terms okay. of health? Yeah. Uh, I, feel, I feel good body-wise, apart from the legs. Yeah. 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 So you're just a bit tight, that's all really. Only in the legs, yeah. Not yeah. tight sleep-wise. But oh. I only wish the legs would work. Yeah. I don't want to work anymore. So, I'm sleeping, right? And then Martin wakes me up and he goes, Come on, Watson, get up now, let's go, let's go. Well, my legs have got it. I don't know where he's got the energy from or who came in his dream, but after about three, four hours, he's got up full of energy and he's determined to get to the next uh, you know, milestone, uh, which is um, pole number 1125, I think it is. So he's up and he's got his he's head to me. Look, look, look. Uh, you know, uh, you've, got, you've got to admire uh, the fight this guy, uh, determination. Where's the energy come from? Upstairs. Yeah? That's good. Good to hear. How you do you feel it come from? How you feeling? You feeling good? Yeah. yeah. I feel I can do it more. I hope so. I hope so. The shot is like... It's uh, recharged, I mean. Obviously a lot of good. Of course, taking another couple of tablet sets helps. 
Yeah. So I could like suffer for it in the morning. So, while in Iraq, I mean, because you know, your health wasn't, uh, you know, the greatest when you went to Iraq, and that, what sort of challenges did you have to face in terms of, you know, like your legs were hurt? Yeah, you were well, tired? yeah, um, one of the most important things, of course, was because of my guinea pig treatment at the cancer centre, is um, I had to be very careful about hygiene and cleanliness because I only have uh, pens. I only have. Um, about a two percent um, immunity. Immunity, yeah, my immunity system. Um, you know, because my immune system is spent fighting the cancer. So that worried me. As you know, I wasn't happy in one particular situation. You know, sleeping with lots of bodies, which wasn't being derogatory, but me worried about picking something up. You know, and being in close proximity to a lot of people. So Martin's kind of like just, just stormed out. Um, he was, you know, he was quite angry. Um, obviously, he's really tired, um, and, and the walk has taken a great toll on his legs. Um, he was a bit upset with, with you know, some of the, um, you know, the facilities and the actual arrangement of, of staying at these mokibs. Um, I've just seen him over there. He's having a cup of tea. I'm going to try and talk to him and calm him down a little bit and really get to the issue of, of what's bothering him and then hopefully we can um, you know, bring him back on track and shall we can carry on with this walk inshallah. Alhamdulillah, I spoke to Martin, um, you know, I, I, I spoke to him about what he was going through, what he was feeling, it was quite understandable that um, you know, it's been a very, very tiring day for him um, and we're talking about you know, him getting a good night's rest inshallah and tomorrow going forward and trying to reach Karbala inshallah. I had a rough night, I'm afraid. Not much sleep, had a couple of hours. Too much noise for me, woke me up early this morning with all the TV guys, which is fair enough. Um, just expected more like when we arrived last night, you know, thought I was going to get a bit of comfort and all that, and it wasn't forthcoming. Um, I'm just about at it now, I'm tired out, knackered out, had enough. So I'm ready to go and have some comfort, have a shower have a decent sleep when I'm ready for it, uh, just a decent meal. Um, that's about it really, I suppose. After a strenuous few hours, we decided for Martin's comfort to complete the rest of the journey to Karbala by car. Even though he was not able to complete the whole walk, it was a remarkable achievement that he had managed some of it despite his medical concerns. Okay, now this is where I'll be staying now for the next couple of nights. Um, one of the workers, uh, known as Malteser, from London. Uh, this is his grandfather in the garden there. Uh, he's kindly offered to put us up for a few nights, uh, amongst others that are coming later. Um, and uh, this is the entrance. If you'd like to follow me through, I'll take you into, into where we'll be staying. Now here is the lovely room, uh, hopefully the camera can capture the loveliness of this room. It's a very nice room, dedicated to Imam Hussain as well. Uh, what a lovely room to be able to stay in for a couple of nights, so hopefully I can recharge my batteries. So you finally made it to the shrines here in Karbala, where Come everyone's on. been walking to. Yes. And this is its quietest. Yes, uh, we've got a result, haven't we, without a doubt. Yeah, getting the car all the way this way. But even though everything's, everything's developed now, this was the battleground. Yeah, for sure. This is what people have been walking towards, all yeah, the way from course, Najib. Yeah, yeah. So, man, how does that look like from the finish line? Yeah, it's lovely, isn't it? Yeah, Can you still see the phone yeah, numbers? It's up, right? for it, it's finishing line, yeah. Well, the first thing that hit me, I think, was the... What's the word? The fabulousness of the shrines, you know, and I was, remember showing a picture to one of my younger nephews and he was astounded, you know, because he's young and obviously hasn't travelled apart from holiday stuff, and he said, blimey, you wouldn't think such things were in Iraq, and this is where people go wrong, you know, they, they really don't know, they only see what they see on the news, you know, and uh, obviously Iraq's got that reputation for a lot of problems in recent years albeit caused mostly by the Americans and us, but 
Um, yeah, that's it really. It's fabulous. So, like, you know, the, when you get inside and you just see all that, it's just stunning. Being there looking at the shrines and all the memorials, um, how does it feel? Because you've read up on the Battle of Karbala. Can you relate to the city and the location now that you've read, read about it and also visited? Yes, definitely. Um, you have to be there and picture the army and this, that and the other to appreciate it more. Um, but yeah, it did make, a, you know, it was important. Kabul is a special place, you know, the whole place is a religious centre, like, isn't it? Like, so, um, it is a special place. Uh, but one of the things that hit me was talking to you. I can't remember where we were now. But um, I said about how the people were all dressed in black and seemed a bit down and all that, and it hadn't, I hadn't really thought about it where they were actually grieving. It was like a funeral, and I, I hadn't actually sunk into me. And then I could th look at them in a different way then, that they were actually um, grieving, like, you know, and that rammed home to me in that, I don't know what you call it, like four court or whatever, between the Abash shrine and the in, other shrine, in, in the seeing shrines. all the poetry being read out, especially with the Iranians, and seeing grown men in tears, like, you know, uh, you just wouldn't see that in this country, you know, over something that happened, what, 600 BC? That shows how strong the, the religion is. Well, I'm sure it's a big relief for those that have walked a long, long way, you know, to actually get here. But emotionally, I should imagine their emotions are pretty powerful, like, you know, and they're, they're ready to probably spend the rest of the night, those that have just arrived, paying homage, I suppose, for want of a better word. And uh, obviously feeling a lot of sadness, I guess, you know, thinking back to the... I'm sure they've picture what happened in their minds like won't they and start feeling sad and some will be weeping I guess won't they um, others will be just more wrapped up in the religion side of it like you know and praising God and what a pleasure it is to be here etc so yeah. mine do you believe in miracles um, do I believe in miracles? Well, I'm sure some miracles have occurred in, over time, I guess, yeah. Because they say this is the place where miracles happen. So All many right. people come here yes. with, with wishes, with, with uh, ambition, with hopes, um, and they come here and a lot of their dreams are fulfilled by asking from Abbas. Mm. And I'm just going to ask you, have you got anything to ask from Abbas? Because he is one that we say who never says no, especially to a guest. No, I, I don't feel I've got the right to ask, to be honest with you. Number one, it's not my religion. Number two, I haven't been a religious person. Do you want to just um, wait up here for me? So I have not got the right to ask, uh, you know, to ask for anything like that, I'm afraid. You know, I wouldn't. No. Why, why do you feel that you not being a religious person Kind of like, you know, uh, makes you um, what's the word? feel unable outside. to ask. Outside, excluded. No, I so, don't think I've got the right to. Or like for myself. No, I haven't. No, I don't think so. Do you think it's you decides who has the right, or is it up to Abbas who decides the right? Well, and you know, ask he doesn't people that believe in a God know that God just knows your thoughts, etc. Um, so I don't really need to come here myself to ask for anything. I can understand other people, uh, you know, from this religion, Shia people coming and asking, yeah, without a doubt, you know, this is the place for them to come, yeah. like people go to laws, etc. Um, but not for me, no. If you were Shia, and you, and you, uh, what would you ask for? If I was here, yeah, I were. were determined to get your answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm just asking to uh, look after all my family, you know, especially my um, eldest granddaughter who's got problems, um, mainly them. And uh, once I've asked him to look after my family. And, uh, will, will you be open to make a prayer? 
I do any playing that I do um, on my own. Yeah. You know, not, That's sure. fair enough. I always have done um, That's my way. Um, but yeah, I would ask for my family, obviously, immediate family, to stay in good health, etc. And would obviously finish off to um, just thank him and to continue. You know, I've had two years with cancer now, uh, of, of um, incurable cancer, stage four. Um, and I've had two years, you know, um, and long may that continue. So that would be what I would ask for for myself. Uh, after my immediate family, I've done not really my limit, didn't I? You know, each time I couldn't have done any further. You know, lay, lay down arteries and my legs are throbbing and muscles are twitching, like you know, for, for a whole day afterwards and that. And I have to try and relax, you know, and get the feeling back, knowing that I've got to try and do a bit more walking the next day. You know, so yeah, it puts things into perspective. So we're going to see you again next year? Oh. Well, it'd be nice to say, yeah, definitely, wouldn't it? Yeah. I'd come here again, of course I would, yeah, I'd love to. Come here, come here every year, why not? I would do. What would bring you back every year? Uh, what would bring me back? Yeah, why, why would you uh, come back some, every year? Something I'm paying for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to come back. Um, well, I could, come, I could easily say I could come back out of disrespect for, you know, I like this like a Shia religion like you know I think it's a good religion I think it's the true as I said before the true um, religion myself and uh, seeing what people do I like to join in such a thing you know it's uh, it's my sort of sounds and smells and food and things like you know so yeah I'll come back well, what makes you say Shia Islam is the true religion only from what I've read you know and I've read both sides you know dug right into it as I've said before you know, for me, no one's going to make me change my mind, right? You know, I could, I could be like uh, the Shirazi man, you know, who wrote the Pressure of Nights yeah. and uh, invite all the sunny to sit in a room with me and try and persuade me that it's any different. And I would listen to them, but I don't think they'd be able to win their argument. I really don't. I would challenge them, I wouldn't try. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. I'm gonna get knocked on the. <laughs> they'd be knocked on my no, door. No one's gonna, no one's gonna touch you. No one's gonna touch you. Sorry. So Martin, how you been? And then glad to be back in London. Well, not really. I'd sooner be abroad, especially in the sun. You know, there's lots of countries I visit now since my interest in the Middle East the last 30, 40 years. I wish I'd known and done when I was younger because obviously I don't have the strength for it anymore but uh, I mean it's always nice to be home you know you miss your family but as soon as you're back you want to go again because that's how it works when you have itchy feet <laughs> and how about that how, how's your health I mean I hope you've improved yeah well I'm, to be fair I'm good you know you wouldn't think looking at me you know that I had cancer of the lung liver back and pancreas um, you know I had that big lump taken out of my head. Um, I've got the hidden disabilities like, you know, the f fatigue of the legs. Uh, my appetite's quite poor, obviously. Uh, sometimes I sleep, sometimes I don't. But that doesn't bother me. You know, I'm alive, so that's the way it is. Would you do it all again? Oh, for sure. I'd do it next month. No worries. I'd love to. And do you actually plan to go back to Ella? I'd like to, without a doubt. I'd like to see some of the places that I didn't get to. There's so many. I really wanted to go to Kufa, you know, being the land of Ali. Uh, and that's very close as well. And I didn't make it. Babylon, I'd like to see. You know, there's so many places. The Marsh Arabs, as I said earlier, I'd like to go and visit. But I think that's an impossibility. But yeah, I might get there. You never know. Never say never. <laughs>